Okay, good afternoon. Um, continuing on with our Pasha Weekly Wisdom, um, I would like to continue into the book of Genesis. So we're into the sixth portion. We're six weeks into the reading the book of Genesis, and this week's Torah portion is called Pasha Toldot. So again, if you remember, you know, this, this idea that um, the Torah portion is always named after one or two or uh, beginning some of the words in the beginning of the sentence of the first the sentence of the Torah reading. So this week's Torah reading is Pasha Toldot. I'm going to read you the very beginning and there's a lot to unpack here. So we're going to dive in because there's a lot to say. These are the offspring of Isaac, son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, from Padan Aram, sister of Lavan, the Aramean, as a wife for himself. So I'll just stop there. Um, interestingly, if you remember, last week we spoke about the life of Sarah, Isaac's parents, Abraham and Sarah. We spoke about them. At the beginning of last week's Torah portion, Sarah dies, and we, um, we have Abraham buying the burial plot in Hebron for his wife. And at the end of the Torah reading, we read about the death of Abraham. So we're sort of picking up the story now. We're learning about the, the one child of Abraham and Sarah who is going to take the, 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 the blessing that, Hashem is, that God is giving Abraham and giving it down through the generations. It's going to go down through the line, through Isaac. Isaac is the next in line. He's the, essentially the first... The first um, uh, you know, Abraham is a monotheist. He, he discovers God. He sees God in the universe. He starts to understand what God wants of him. He, he follows many of the laws of the Torah. And uh, Isaac is born into that. This is he's the he's the extension of Abraham. So it's interesting when we when it, when when the, the Torah starts by saying, "And these are the generations of Isaac." These are the generations of Isaac, but we read that Abraham gave, gave birth to Isaac. So what, what's really going on? So one of the ideas that Rabbi Foreman brings out is that what we all do, including Abraham, including Isaac, including Noah, including all the people where it says these are these are the generations of so-and-so, is that we are birthing ourselves. That our life work, as much as it might be the goodness we do in the world and all the good deeds we do and the children we have and the, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and the institutions we build, et cetera, et cetera, but perhaps maybe just to concentrate it down and say one of, the, one of the main things that we achieve in this world is our own self-development, our own ability to know ourselves and to birth ourselves and to create ourselves and to find the goodness in ourselves and bring that out. And I think this is really the, um, the ikar, the, the, the essence of this week's Torah portion is for each one of us to understand that we a major part of our life journey is to um, is to be at the end of our life <laughs> to be the best person we can be the best you know Alyssa Feldreich could be the best who you know whoever you are the best you that you can be and uh, so how do we do that and I think that one of the things that we learn about Isaac Isaac is the least talked about of our patriarchs we we read a couple of you know major um, Torah portions about Abraham and all the different tests he went through and the binding, binding of Isaac and the leaving his land and the, the wars that he under, underwent, etc. And they had to circumcise him, they had to buy the land for the burial place for his wife, which was a major test. So he had uh, 10 tests. He had many, many struggles. He had many tests in his life that he had to overcome to create himself. Um, we learn a lot about Jacob. Jacob, who is the father of the 12 tribes, and, and he, he's the one that goes down, you know, he favors uh, Joseph. We read the whole Joseph story going down to Egypt. We're going to read about a lot about Jacob. We don't read very much about Isaac, yet Isaac is one of our major patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Who's Isaac? This Torah portion is going to teach us um, the fundamental, perhaps, lesson to learn of who Isaac is and what it is that he does. So yes, he is the descendant, the direct descendant, the one who, with whom Abraham is focusing his lineage down onto Isaac. And if you remember, in the last couple of weeks, we read about how Sarah, was, Sarah his wife, was unable to have children. It was hard for her. And she gave, her, her, um, she gave to Abraham Hagar, who became also a wife to Abraham. And she had a son called Yishmael. And if you remember last week or the week before, how um, the influence that Yishmael had on the child of Sarah, on Isaac, uh, was one in which, the influence was one in which Sarah said, this can't happen. I can't have this child in this home. It's a bad influence, etc., etc. We talked about that before. And Hagar and Yishmael are banished. They have to leave the home of Abraham and Sarah. They have to leave. And um, 
just, you know, think about that. Like Isaac is living in a home where his half brother is being expelled from the home. So what kind of impact that might leave on this young child. And when we read about the stories of our patriarchs, we see that their lives were not easy. They didn't lead, you know, lead these, these lives that were all kind of like everything went smoothly and everything was easy. They, they had difficult lives and we learn from how they lived that life and what they did to create the communities and the families that they did. So we're learning from them <laughs> what goes on. So that's, that's what we're doing. We're delving in and we're looking and we're understanding what happened. So here's Isaac and his half-brother is being expelled with his, with his stepmother, with his... I guess it's his stepmother, Hagar, they're being expelled. And, um, and then at the end um, of all these trials and tribulations that are, that are one of them, one of the last trials that Abraham has to go through is to take his son, and it says his only son, the one he loves, Isaac, take Isaac up and bind him and uh, offer him up, offer him up. So we talked about that, the binding of Isaac. But Isaac, he goes along with it. We talked about that, that he's happy to go along. He doesn't complain. He doesn't fight. But he's somewhat of a passive participant. We don't read about the binding of Isaac as being a test for Isaac. We read about it as being a test for Abraham, that he had to bring his son, the son he loves. So I think, again, one of the major themes going through this story is the parent-child relationship, what that looks like and how it manifests itself and how we live that parent-child relationship. So Isaac's done two things. He's, he's willingly um, going along and hearing from his mother, from his father that God wants him to be brought up as a sacrifice and he goes with him willingly to be sacrificed. And he also watches as his half-brother is being expelled from the home. So just sort of pocket those two things in your back pocket. And now we have Isaac. So Isaac, he only marries, he only marries one wife. He marries Rivka. It's the only one he marries. And again, after the binding of Isaac, they come off the mountain and we don't read very much about Isaac after that. We don't read about him coming back down and rejoining the group that had gone up the mountain. We don't read about that. We don't read about him having any kind of involvement in the burial of his mother, Sarah. He's silent in the narrative that the Torah teaches us about the involvement that Isaac has in the burial of his mother. And really, the primary mourner, many, many, you know, we learn out, is the child. The child's responsibility is to bury their parents. Hopefully, it goes that way around, not the other way around. Sadly, it does sometimes happen the other way around. But, but the uh, responsibility is on the children to bury their parents. But we don't read about that. We read about Abraham burying his wife Sarah. We don't. Where's Isaac in the story? Silence. We don't hear about that. And the and the involvement that Isaac has in finding himself a wife is also silent. It's Abraham that sends his servant Eliezer off to find a wife for his son and that, you know, there's a whole test that there has to be somebody who's kind, etc., etc. We talked about that last week. But we don't read much about Isaac. Like, what's his involvement? What does he say? Who does he want? Like, he sort of goes along with it. Um, and if you remember last week, one of the places, one at the at the when when um, Isaac meets up with Rebecca for the first time, he's in the field. He's coming from praying to God. And I read a medrash that says that what is he praying for? It says that Isaac is praying that he should not be tested in the same way or at all um, should not be tested in in the way that he saw his father being Abraham being tested. That all these tests that Abraham had to go through were hard. They were difficult and he's, there were struggles. And, and, and Isaac saying, don't test me. I don't want to be tested, <laughs> which is which is a prayer we have. We ask every morning, please don't test us. Um, you know, that, that things should go well without being tested. I should be able to manifest my best self without being tested. So please don't test me, um, is a prayer that we say even to this day. And we understand that that's the prayer that Isaac was saying in this field. And he's coming from, he's coming from a place, and this is probably not, you know, the, the stories that we necessarily grow up with, but he's coming from a place called Be'er Lachai Ro'i. And this is a place where Hagar and Yishmael are living. This is where Hagar is, uh, she goes off with uh, Yishmael and he cries, blah, blah, blah. And he ends up in this place, Be'er Lachai Ro'i. And Isaac, when he comes down off of, um, off of the uh, binding of Isaac, when he comes off of Hamaria, he goes to this place, Be'er Lachai Ro'i. And, uh, and, it, and, it's, and it's the back story is that he wanted to, when he heard that his mother had died, he wanted as much as he wanted to be, have a life partner. And he knew that Abraham is selling, sending his servant off to find a, a, a partner for 
Isaac, that Isaac is saying it's not good for my father to be alone. And he goes back and he gets Hagar to come back and remarry his father, which is kind of interesting that he that he's coming from that place. And he's also coming from a place where he had um, compassion. He had some relationship, apparently, with Hagar and with Yishmael. That at the end of last week's Torah portion, when Abraham dies, it's both of these children, both of the children, uh, the major children of Abraham, um, Isaac and Yishmael, that bury him. So what's going to happen in this Torah portion? And who is Isaac? Isaac is the link, really, very much so, the link between the Abraham that we read about and the Jacob that's going to come. And that the, line the lineage is going to go that way. But what's happening, Pasha's told us, is crucial. And um, we read about the fact, again, like Abraham and Sarah, I Isaac has very similar situations that happened to him, that happened to Abraham and Sarah. They are also struggle to have children. They also suffer from infertility. They're barren. They're unable to have children easily. It doesn't come to them easily. Did not come easily to Abraham and Sarah, as you know. And uh, so they pray. Both of them pray. And it says that Isaac entreated God opposite his wife because she was barren. And um, and she also prays, and Hashem allowed himself to be entreated, and his wife, Rebecca, conceived. Again, they're praying for each other. They're praying. In the, in, in, in the previous story, right, Sarah says, I can't have children, so here, have Hagar. And Abraham says, okay, I'll take Hadar, Hagar. I'll have, I'll have descendants through Hagar. Isaac's not going to do that. Isaac says, no, this is my one wife. I'm going to have children through this wife. And he, and on, on some level, he prays that he doesn't have to go through the test that Abraham had to go through and take a, a concubine or take another wife and have children through this other wife. He wants to have his, his, his destiny through Rebecca. And he prays and prays and prays that that should be the way it is. Um, I want to, I want a sidebar comment here, um, sort of what's going on in my life and how the, um, the, the, the prayers that we say, many of the prayers that we say, I say, um, are in the, in the prayer book and, and they're prayers I say every day and I say them by rote and they become very kind of fixed. And that is one aspect of prayer is to sort of have the commitment to, you know, faithfully say these prayers every day and sometimes I connect to them differently, sometimes not. But then there's this other aspect of prayer that I think I just want to like pull out and into the light into the light and say, you know, that really it's a prayer is about and all of this Torah learning is about having connection to God. Where's God? How do we seek God? How do we access God? How do we how do we have a relationship with God? And some of it is some of it's in many, many different ways, different people, different ways. But uh, one of the things um, I'm challenging myself is to literally talk to God every day. Just just take a 10 minutes, 15 minutes and just you know, go somewhere on my own and just talk to God, you know, like tell him what, you know, what you're thinking and what you're feeling and what you, what you, what you want and how you are and how things are going and what you're grateful for. And just have that conversation. And we learn that from Isaac. Isaac's the, the, the forefather who has this kind of a conversation with God in the field, you know, and he's having, it's not in the morning where he's grateful that he's alive and he's not in the evening where he's scared he's going to die while he's asleep. It's in the middle, it's in the afternoon where he's literally just conversing with God and telling him, like, like here I am and this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm thinking and this is what I want. Please don't test me. And then later here now saying, please can, you know, the, 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 the next generation that's going to, that's going to take the lessons of Abraham, my, my, my father, says Isaac, my father, Abraham has these lessons. I'm the link in the chain. I want to pass it down to Jacob, or my, to my, to my descendants. Help me do that. And don't test me. Don't test me. Please don't test me. So thank God, you know, uh, Rebecca becomes pregnant and it turns out unbeknownst to her that she has twins in, in her, in utero. And uh, they're struggling in utero and there's stories about what that struggle inside the inside of her uterus that these that these children are fighting that that they that they represent um, cosmic forces in the universe that they represent a fight between spirituality and physicality that we inherit that we, that we um, engage in the fight between physical and spiritual. And um, she doesn't know what's going on. She doesn't know she's having twins. She doesn't have ultrasounds back then. And she, she just feels this craziness. It says that when she w would walk by um, a holy place, that w there would be kind of one struggle. And if she would walk by a house of idolatry, there would be another kind of struggle going on. And she didn't understand what was happening. And so she, she talks to God. She's talking to God, literally talking to God. And she says, why is this? And she actually even questions her life. Like, what is the point of my life? 
if this is happening. There's so much pain in my uterus and what's going to be and how is it going to happen? Is it going to be one baby is going to have both the struggle going on? Is it like, what's the purpose? What's the point? And she entreats God and she went to inquire of Hashem. And God says to her, two nations are in your womb. Two regimes from the inside shall be separated. The might shall pass from one regime to the other and the elder shall serve the younger. That's the kind of, that's the, the nugget that we take away, that the younger, that the uh, elder will serve the younger. So who gets born first? Um, the, the Esau gets born first and Isaac, excuse me, Jacob comes out second. So when her term to bear grew full, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first one emerged red entirely like a hairy mantle and they named him Esau. And after that, his brother emerged with his hand grasping onto the heel of Esau. So they called his name Jacob, Yaakov. And Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. And they grew up. And it turned out that Esau was the one who was more of the hunter and man of the field. And Jacob was the more wholesome man, abiding in tents. So we have these two children. And uh, one is born hairy and he's red of complexion. And it says that he uh, was almost fully developed. That there's a sort of... Um, uh, a maturity about this baby when he came out that extended into his life to the extent that um, he kind of felt like he was fully developed. He didn't have to like work on himself. He was like a finished product and a big warning sign there, you know, that another lesson to learn is well, none of us are finished products, obviously. <laughs> and if you go back to the what we said in the beginning about the the generations of whoever of, of you and me is who I become at the end of my life. Who are we? Who have we created ourselves to be? And we, the only way you can do that is to humble yourself and say you're not perfect and to recognize the things you're doing wrong and to struggle with yourself and to struggle in relationships and sort of work through certain things and like, you know, kind of like go through ups and downs of life and the vicissitudes of life that kind of create you. And at the end of your life, you, you, and, and at certain points along the way, you know, you reflect on yourself and you try to improve yourself and you work on yourself. It's a whole concept of Yom Kippur of having a time where we can reevaluate ourselves in a very concentrated way and, and, and figure out who we are and what we want to be and where we want to go and what we're running to become. That we, that we do on a constant basis, that's who the Jewish people are meant to be, is the people who are always working themselves and always growing. We, we had, a, we had a, um, uh, a parlor meeting uh, last night, and one of the questions that we were asked by um, uh, people who were doing a survey is, what is a meaningful Jewish experience you've had in your life? And, um, and um, I, I think all of life is a meaning, meaningful Jewish experience experience we don't pluck out one thing okay you can say all right when when this happened or when that happened that was a meaningful but in, in in the entirety of our lives it's all a meaningful jewish experience you know all of our lives is a process of growing and learning and reevaluating and messing up and feeling bad and like you know going through all these kinds of ways of returning to the essence of who we are etc etc all that yom kippur talk is what we're doing all the time and i think that's one of the points of Esau didn't feel like he had to do that. He was a finished product. He didn't have to work on himself. He didn't have to change himself. He was like, everything else was, it was somebody else's fault. It was, you know, the, the other guy's the idiot. Like, I'm fine, you're wrong. And to always live life like that, you're never going to improve, you're never going to change. Whereas Esau, um, excuse me, Jacob, on the other hand, was someone who was holding on to the heel of, of Esau and uh, sort of always climbing, always trying to like improve himself and, and, and better himself and find spirituality and find, um, you know, holiness, etc., etc. And so they were very opposite kinds of children and they had very opposite energies that they were putting into the world. So traditionally, when we look at the story of Isaac and Rebecca giving birth to these twins, and then what unfolds in this story is that um, obviously Isaac is the first, excuse me, excuse me, Esau is the firstborn and he's the one that's going to get the birthright. He's the one who's going to get the blessing for the firstborn. And if you remember the story that um, Esau, who is the hunter, who is out doing his thing in the field, he comes in, he's starving hungry, he's literally quote unquote dying of hunger. And there is Jacob inside stewing up some lentils, a pottage of lentils. And uh, Esau says to him, give me some of that red stuff. I need it. I'm going to die without it. I need it, need it, need it. So apparently, J 
Jacob gives him some bread first, just to satiate his hunger so that he's not like operating from this place of like, give you anything, um, you have to just give me food. So it gives him something to satisfy, you know, his, his, his uh, you know, intense craving for food and his, his feeling that he's going to die. And then he says, well, I'll give you this food in exchange for the birthright. And, uh, and uh, the story unfolds that Esau doesn't value the birthright so much and he, um, and he says, fine, no problem, I'll give it to you. And he gives it to him and then he has the food and he gets up and he leaves and he makes fun of the birthright. Like, who, who needs it anyway? And, and what we learn out from here, and if you remember when Rebecca says, I'm pregnant with this baby and they're battling inside inside of me and I don't want to, like, what's, what's the purpose? What's my life about? We have this questioning of life that Rebecca does. And again here, when um, Esau is literally in his own mind about to die of hunger, he says, like, like, what's the point anyway in my life? You know, if I don't live, what's the point anyway of this, of this, of this birthright? I'm going to die if you don't feed me. So it's more important that I, that I live. And uh, so he sells away his birthright. And again, it's like this focus on um, our life purpose. And our life purpose, um, according to our tradition, is to is to again like I said birth ourselves into the next world so when we when we finish this world we've done so much <laughs> we've uh, we've uncovered a lot of the a lot of the spirituality that in, in, that is in the world it, to the best of our abilities and that when we and then at the point where we die and our soul is uh, released from the confines of its body that it moves into a higher realm it has it has an uh, there's an afterlife there's an afterlife that exists that exists and uh, we recognize that and we and we and we know that and on some level we can be comforted about that and it seems that Esau doesn't have that perspective he doesn't that doesn't doesn't value what comes after life it's only here and now so if I die what's the point so just give me the food give it to me however it is just give it to me and he opens his mouth and Jacob pours it down his throat so there's this sort of like just give me food just give me physicality don't know so what we have to understand is in, in both of these cases where we have these cosmic forces, we have Esau, the man of the field, who's the guy who is like hunting and, and, he's, and he's physical and he's trapping and he's doing his outside physical work and it's really all about him. He's not looking to improve himself. He's only looking to, you know, eat and he's a hunter. He's, he's, he's sort of his um, essence is to kill and um, that he doesn't channel it in a good way. Like we're all born with certain tendencies good and bad and turns how we use them we can use all of our strengths in certain ways and obviously the goal is to try to use all of them in good ways and and none of that and all of them in not none of them in good non-good ways and how it plays out is that Esau is using all of his energies in bad ways so we have these parents and it says that um that um that they were loved and it says very interesting is that Isaac loved Esau, for game was in his mouth, and Rebekah loves Jacob. So there's a lot to say on this. So we have two parents, Isaac and Rebekah, and Isaac apparently um, loved Esau, it says it right in the text, because the game was in his mouth, because Esau brings him food, because Esau is the source of his meals, he gets his dinners from Esau, from Esau. he loved him. Was it conditional, was it unconditional? What was going on here? And, I, and, and it says that Rebecca loves Jacob ongoing, ongoing. And it doesn't say why, it just loves him, right? So there's a lot to talk about here. One of them is that um, on the surface, you could say, well, this is parents playing favorites and we don't play favorites. That doesn't work out well. It never works out well for parents to choose one child to love more or to have a, a, a um, to uh, favor, to give, to give more um, attention to than the other one. It doesn't work out well. So be careful there. And do we see the, the parents, Isaac and Rebecca, do we see them not working in tandem? Are they not a team? What's going on here? And I heard an amazing um, uh, class on this where, where it actually suggests that Isaac and uh, Rebecca were actually very much on the same page and they understood that opposites attract. Esau, Isaac, was the man who was um, really kind of a passive, passive man. He went along with Abraham up to Hamaria to be offered up as a sacrifice. He went along with the um, whatever plan it was that Abraham had for his wife. He didn't uh, play a part in bearing his mother. There was a, there was a sort of passivity to Isaac. And only when he married Rebecca, 
did he sort of like become revived? Did he become, you know, consoled in the death of his mother and he could start to live his own life? And then he has to live his own life, but he's a more of a passive. He, he's, the, he's the direct student of Abraham. So he really felt this um, necessity to take on the traditions and pass them on and pass them on and give them over to Isaac and give them over to Jacob. Um, or Esau, or Esau, because Esau on some level is the antithesis of Isaac. Esau's the guy in the field. Esau's the guy who's going to fight. Esau's the guy who's going to like be out like in the world, kind of conquering the world. And um, it suggested that Isaac saw that in Esau. But what he also saw is that he's his son and he's not going to reject his son, any son, not any son, not even the wayward son, not even the son at risk, you know, the kid at risk, not even the one who's not quite maybe doing what he wants him to do or doing it perfectly or whatever, that Isaac has the ability to say, I'm not going to banish like Abraham banished uh, Yishmael. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to dig. And we see Isaac as a well digger. We'll come to this in a minute, that he is a well digger. He digs wells. He finds spirituality in under the ground, in the dirt, in the dust. He digs down into these wells and brings up water, brings up life, brings up spirituality, brings up purity. And he did that not just by physically digging wells, which we're going to read about, but he digs, he digs into his children. He digs down into his, into Asaph, into Esau, who is the man of the field, who's hairy and who isn't into self-improvement, etc., etc. And he wants to find, he's looking, he knows that his child has some essence, some spiritual wellspring deep down that he can access. And he's going to dig for that. He's going to look for that. And he's going to shower this kid with love and he's going to bless him and he's going to give to him and he's going to praise him because that's, the kind of parent that he wants to be. So on some level you could say, well, Rebecca says, okay, well, you, 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 Isaac, you take care of Esau and I'll take care of Jacob. Jacob is the child in the tent, the one who's learning the traditions, learning, you know, learning about spirituality and he's like smooth skin and he's gentle and he's passive and he's this and that and the other. And that's, I'll take care of this son and you take care of that son and we're going to do it together. I would suggest that there's another way to read it that doesn't show that Isaac and Rebecca are at odds with each other, but that they are a partnership. They're actually a very tight partnership, recognizing their own inherent talents and that the talent that Isaac has is to be able to dig deep into, into, into looking beyond the surface, beyond the surface of whatever it is that the child in front of you is engendering feelings engenders in you when they don't do what you ask them or they do what you ask them, whatever it is, however it is, however they rub you the wrong way or the right way, whatever, that, that, that Isaac wanted to be the parent who's saying, I'm even in the trying child, I'm going to dig and find holiness and find goodness and I'm going to love and love and love. And I have this capacity to unconditionally love the, even the most difficult child. And I think that that's an important lesson. Like what he saw before and his father Abraham is that Abraham was not only willing to banish Ishmael, which he did, but that he was also willing to um, take his son, take his son Isaac, take him up and offer him up because his, um, his connection to God was such that if God asked him to do something that was completely against his nature, then he was going to do that. And, and now we have Isaac and Isaac sort of forging his own path. He has to like consolidate the lessons he got from his father and say, what kind of patriarch am I going to be? Am I going to be an exact replica of Abraham or am I going to choose my own path? Am I going to, and am I going to you know, make my own way, right? What, how much of my parent am I and how much of an individual am I? And we all do that, right? We all look back at our parents and say, oh my gosh, you know, I think I read somewhere that at age 33, you become your mother. I don't know if it's just women, but apparently at age 33, you, you start to actually really hear yourself um, say things that you remember your mother saying. And I don't know if it's true at 33 or whatever, but at some point, I think we all, on some level, hear, our, hear ourselves becoming a little bit like our parents, our mothers, perhaps, or our fathers. I don't know. I became much more like my mother. But uh, what, what we have with Abraham, excuse me, what we have with Isaac is that after this incident of... Um, of the uh, selling of the birthright, we have Isaac and Rebecca traveling 
to Gerar, which is exactly what Abraham and Sarah did. And there were three wells that Abraham had dug, literal wells, right down in the ground, dig a well. And the Philistines who lived in the area, they stopped them up, they filled them up. And Isaac comes along and he digs the great, he digs those wells, he undigs, he, he uncovers the wells that were dug by his father Abraham. So again, we have that notion, that idea, metaphorically, that as we get older, we, re we discover in ourselves our parents. <laughs> and then, what, is, what does Isaac do? He digs three more wells. He digs three, his own wells. Actually, he digs four wells, but he digs, next, the next story, he digs three wells. He digs his own wells. He has to dig, 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 dig. So metaphorically, or, you know, physically he's digging for water, but metaphorically he's digging for spirituality, he's digging for purity and holiness, and he's digging for that which is uncovered, that which is covered over, that which is Hester, that which is hidden, right? The holiness of each one of us is inside of us, and how manifest is it, and how deeply um, covered over is it? And uh, so just like Isaac is redigging the wells that his father dug so we sort of uncover our own kind of influence that our parents gave us and we kind of uncover that and it becomes like who we are and we recognize that and we decide what we're going to do with that and then we go dig our own wells and we find our own spirituality so getting back to the beginning idea of our our own self-development and our own capacity to find our own spirituality and look for that and uncover that and know that and then link that back up with the his spoted us with the uh, conversation that we have with God in the field, so to speak, or the conversations that we have with God when we're driving our car or walking down the street or waiting in the supermarket line, talking to God, literally talking out loud and having a conversation and connecting through our speech, connecting our inner spiritual soul essence up with God. And here we're about to enter into the month of Kislev, which is the month of Hanukkah. And what's Hanukkah all about? Hanukkah is all about lighting the dark, taking a candle, which is known as the soul of man, is the candle, taking that flame and shining it out into the dark. It's all the same idea. It's the same idea of digging the wells. It's the same idea of Isaac wanting to, um, wanting to bestow extra love on this child Esau that was opposite him, that was different than him, that he recognized had spiritual essence that he was trying to uncover and trying to shower love on and give blessing to, that he had that 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 fervor and that desire given what happened in his life, what he saw before, what the kind of path that he wanted and the kind of family that he wanted, which he didn't get in the end, sadly, but um but that he learnt these lessons. And again the the the, the nugget that we're taking out is whether, whether we see it in ourselves or we see it in our children or we see it in each other and we see it in other people, especially difficult people, <laughs> try to be like Isaac and dig, 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 dig down, find it, find it, find, find, use your energies, use your, all your strengths to find the goodness and find the, that holiness and the spirituality in other people. It's easy to love the people you love, easy. It's harder to love the people you don't love, the people that rub you the wrong way. Dig, 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 be an Isaac and dig. Okay, so um, so this selling of the birthright. So what's interesting is that when Jacob was making this pottage of le lentils, why lentils? Because apparently this was the day that Abraham had died. This is the day that Abraham had died. And so he, uh, Jacob, is making lentil stew to give to his father, Isaac, who is the primary mourner, one of the primary mourners for Abraham. And so he's going to bring him a lentil stew. And again, it's about... Um, lentils being a food for mourners, like an egg, right? So it's common to give an egg to a mourner after a funeral. Um, and also lentils. Lentils represent a wheel. They don't have their circular. It's about the, the cycle of life, right? That there's that we move on, that we keep going, that our soul continues beyond us, that we're like a lentil with no, no beginning and no end. And like it just keeps going around and around. There's no mouth. There's no words to describe what the feelings are, etc., etc., and all of this. And so, and so Jacob taps into that and he's, and he's making this stew to give to his father, the mourner, Isaac, after the burial and the funeral of Abraham, but 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 um, Esau wasn't there. Esau was out doing his stuff in the field, so he wasn't part of that. He'd already separated himself, even though he had the potential. And what Isaac saw in Esau was the potential to 
elevate the physical world, since he was a man of the field, since he was out there in the world, he had the ability to conquer the world and make it more spiritual. He didn't, but he had the potential to do that. And in Isaac's mind, that's what his two children were going to do together. We had the Jacob, who was the spiritual man in the tent, and we had Isaac, uh, Esau, who was the physical man in the field. Put them together, you have a perfect combination. If they were able to work together, if they were able to do their job properly, then they could do it. It says that Isaac's eyes were dimmed, that he's, I don't know exactly where it says it, but it says when that the, at a point when he's getting close to the end of his life and he now wants to bless his children, he calls Esau in because Esau's his firstborn and he wants to give him the birthright, the firstborn birthright. He doesn't know that he sold it, that he sold his birthright for the stew back in the previous story to his brother Jacob. He doesn't know about that. He wants to give the blessing of the firstborn to Esau. So he tells Esau, go out into the field, and go and, and, and catch me some venison, I think, and then cook it up and bring it to me and I'll be satiated. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be filled with this beautiful food and I will bless you. And, uh, so, so off he goes, Esau goes off to catch the, catch the venison. And, um, Rivka, Rebecca is overhearing the story and she knows because she had the prophecy way back in the beginning where it says, which I quoted to you, that the older will serve the younger. The elder will serve the younger. She knew that. She knew that the elder was going to serve the younger. So it had to be that the younger East, uh, the younger Jacob had to get the blessing. And so she tells him to go get um, these two goats and that she'll cook them up the way father likes. And then he'll go in and he'll deceive. He'll pretend to be, he'll pretend to be Esau and he'll get the blessing of the firstborn. And Jacob, Jacob doesn't want to do that. He's like, oh, my father will know and no, no, no. And Rebecca says, no, you have to do it. You don't know. I'll take the blame. You have to do this. This is, this is the prophecy coming true. This is important that you do this. This blessing has to go to you. It has to go to you. So Jacob argues. And one of the amazing things is that Rebecca says, I'm going, you know, put on, put on goat skins, put them on your arms. So when your father feels you, he'll feel the hairiness and he'll think you're Esau and you'll take the clothes. He had these clothes. This is amazing that Esau, Esau, as you remember, is a hunter and he had killed this King Nimrod. King Nimrod had clothes. This is crazy. He had clothes that were the clothes of Adam in the Garden of Eden, that these clothes and from Adam in the Garden of Eden somehow made them wait. I'm not going to go into it now. Got to Nimrod when, when Esau um, kills Nimrod. He takes these garments and these garments are the garments from the Garden of Eden. They're like the, the, these holy garments and animals are attracted to them and they're like supernatural garments. And Esau trusts his mother to take care of them. And so she gives them to Jacob to wear and that Jacob's going to wear these clothes that originated in the Garden of Eden. And he's going to wear these clothes when he brings the food to his father, Jacob, to get this blessing. Crazy, right? And um, so it says that, that Jacob's, uh, um, Isaac's eyes were dimmed. And there's a few reasons why his eyes were dimmed. And we mentioned one of them last week. In the binding of Isaac, when Isaac is on the altar and he's looking up and his father's about to, you know, about to slay him, the heavens open up. We mentioned this last week. The heavens open up and the angels are watching what's going on. And the angels are crying. And the tears from the angels fall into the eyes of Isaac. And they cause him to be, you know, uh, unable to see properly, that they, that they change, that they dim his eyesight, that there's tears of the angels. There's another story that he, uh, beheld, he was, somehow he beheld the glory of God or say saw God or something, whatever that means. And that also caused his eyes to dim. And the, the two other reasons given why his eyes were dimmed, why his eyes were dimmed was one was that Esau took two wives and the, the two wives that he had at the, before he took a third wife, the two wives that he had were idol worshippers and they had their incense burning and they did all their idolatry and their whatever. And the smoke from the incense from these from these idol worshipping daughters in law um, got into his eyes and affected his eyes. And the last reason given as to why his eyes were dimmed is so that this deception could happen so that. When Jacob comes in to get the blessing that Isaac will not know and he'll be kind of like confused and, he, and he'll give the blessing to Jacob because according to all the uh, calculations, it was supposed to go. This is the way it's supposed to go. OK, so Jacob comes in with the food and there's this conversation back and forth with Isaac. 
and uh, Isaac, and it says that Isaac, let me see if I can read this to you, um, I'm, I'm giving a lot of information here, but it says that, um, that uh, so, so he comes to Isaac, and he's, here I am, um, and he says, how is it that you were so quick to find the food, my son? And he said, because God arranged it for me. And Isaac says, come close so I can feel you. And Jacob grew close and he said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are Esau's hands. And, but he didn't recognize him because his hands were hairy and like those of Esau, his brother. So he blessed him. He said, you are indeed my son Esau. And he said, serve me and let me eat of my son's game that my soul may bless you. So he served him and he ate and he bought him wine and he drank. Then his father Esau said, come close if you please and kiss me, my son. So he drew close and he kissed him and he smelled the fragrance of his garments and he blessed him. See, the fragrance of my son is like the fragrance of a field which Hashem has blessed. It's the smell of the field. It's the smell of the garden of Eden that the garments that Jacob was wearing were the garments from the Garden of Eden, and he could smell that smell of the Garden of Eden, and and it, and it was just it just kind of took him into a different spiritual realm. <laughs> it's interesting that the sense of smell is is a very pure sense, and it says that when Messiah comes, that will smell it, that the the will smell it. Like somehow we get used to a certain smell, and when things change, we we uh, are heightened to that, but there's something very spiritual about the sense of smell that's different than sight, different than hearing, different than touch, um, that this uh, taste, but the sense of smell is a very pure uh, smell. And the, in, on the altar in the, ta in, the temp in the temple in Jerusalem, the katares that was offered up, a certain incense that was given up, had one ingredient that was very foul smelling. But yet it got kind of like mixed in with everything else. And so it was it was part of who we are, just this is a sidebar comment, part of who we are as the Jewish people, that everybody's included in the in the mix, right? We might be a bouquet of flowers. This is an Adrian Gold, but it might be all a bouquet of flowers, but each one's different, but we're all a bouquet. And somebody somewhat some some people might be more of a dandelion, and more people might be some people might be more like the sunflower, but we all have we're all in the bundle, we're all in the bouquet, we're all in the incense offering we're all in this smell so as much as as there's a deception going on here there's also a lot of um kind of bringing the prophecy to fruition that's going on and Jacob sort of overcoming this man of truth essence who he is just like Abraham his grandfather had to overcome chesed that the, the character trait Abraham had to be the kindest person in the whole world to be unadulterated kindness was asked to bring up his son as an offering like to go against his nature to go against his nature to in service of God Jacob is also being asked to go all against his nature of, of truth to get the blessing that his mother wanted and he had to like he had to listen to the voice of his mother. His mother said, you have to do this. This is important for you to do. You have to do this. This is, this is the blessing has to go through you. And he's blessed with power and physicality. He's blessed with uh, more physical blessings. He says um, you, that the God give you, may God give you of the dew of the heavens of the fatness of the earth, of earth and abundant grain and wine. Peoples will serve you and regimes will prostrate themselves to you. Be a lord to your kinsman and your mother's son will prostrate themselves to you. Cursed be those who curse you and blessed be those who bless you. This, this blessing that Isaac gives Jacob is thinking that he's giving it to Esau and he's giving him physical prowess. He's giving him physical blessings and he's giving it to Jacob. So Jacob, who is the spiritual man, who is the man who's you know, destined to take the blessing that was given to Abraham and then Isaac and now to Jacob, that they will we'll inherit the land that will be, you know, um, 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 uh, very multiply a lot like the stars in the sky and the sand and the, and the, 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 the grains of sand that, that we will multiply, that we will be a big, we're a big nation, big people, and that we will have the land, that spiritual blessing. That, that went down through the uh, the patriarchs, but also Jacob gets the physical blessing too. And it says that after the blessing, he became more of a physical man, right? So he, up until this point, he was in the tent. He was just like this, you know, guy in school who, like the nerdy guy with the, you know, with, with no suntan, you know, with very pale and skinny and thin and like not very physical. 
and that after he got this blessing and uh, and his mother is worried that Esau is going to kill him, sends him away, that he starts to then become physical. He, a he acquires a physical um, nature. He becomes much more, he becomes a shepherd and he has to work, he has to work seven years for Rachel, for a one wife, and then he gets Leah, and we're going to read about that in the coming few weeks, but that he becomes much more of a, he acquires a physical nature in response to this blessing that he got. Up until that point, he was the man of spirituality and Esau was the man of physicality. And after the blessing where, where his father blesses him that he should become, he should, he will inherit the physicality and have power, etc. Then he becomes more physical and he, and he needs that for the rest of his sojourn through life. He needs that physical energy to do what he needs to do to become, you know, the next, uh, the next um, forefather, to be the Jacob that, that is our forefather. So he gets both of those blessings. So he he um, he acquires that. So um, but Esau comes back in at the point right at the point where the blessings been given. That's when Esau comes in. So at the and it says scarcely had um, Jacob um, says and it was when Isaac had finished blessing Jacob. Jacob had scarcely left from the presence of Isaac than. Esau, his brother, comes back in the hunt and he comes in and he realizes the blessing's been given to his brother and he cries and he says, do you have a blessing for me? And I think one of the things to learn from this is that Esau, however much he was trying to deceive his father by saying, I'm a very holy person and, I'm, and he asked him questions of Torah, which really was just to deceive his father and make his father think that he was trying to be a holy person, which he wasn't, but he was trying to fool his father into thinking that he was, but, um, but that he had a relationship with his father. He loved his father and he comes in and he had a relationship. I, I, Isaac has spent a lot, a lot of energy and a lot of time nurturing relationship with this son. So when he comes in and he realizes that the blessing was given to the, to Jacob, he says, he says, you have a blessing for me? Is there a blessing for me? Can you still bless me, Father? He still has that relationship with his father. Jacob had, excuse me, Isaac has succeeded in a way that Abraham hadn't because Abraham was told to banish Ishmael. Ishmael was gone from his life. But it does say that he visited him a couple of times. But anyway, Isaac wasn't going to send his sons away, either of them, either of them. He wants, he wants this family, he wants to create a family, even those opposites, even though there's tension, even though there are cosmic forces at, at battle in his household. He's trying with all his might to, to dig deep and to find the spirituality in, his, in, his, in this son that's difficult to parent. And he's trying to do that. And on some level, he succeeds because at the end of the story, Esau says, where's the blessing for me? And Esau blesses him with physicality. Um, and he is able to still bless him, even though it's not the blessing and it's not, you know, it's a different kind of blessing, but it's a, it's a blessing nonetheless. So um, maybe one of those, let's see where we are with time. So I think, I think one of the things to really recognize is what I pick up on is the, uh, the link that Isaac is between Abraham and uh, Jacob and how he, he's digging these wells. That's really all we know about about Isaac is he's digging the wells. He digs wells. And when he's digging wells, he's bringing out from the hidden places spirituality and godliness and holiness and essence and purity and, and light. He's bringing that out. And how apropos to read this Torah portion as we begin the month within which Hanukkah manifests itself. This is the month of Hanukkah. We're about to enter into, I think tomorrow is Rosh Chodesh, is the new month of Kislev. And it's, and it's the month of Hanukkah where it's about light in the dark. And Isaac is the man, the, quint, the quintessentially, metaphorically, is digging, digging inside of himself to bring it out, to be his own man, to not just be the replica of his father, even though many of the scenarios of his life replicate things that happened to his father. He is replicating his father. He is redigging the wells that his father dug. He is doing that. And he's also digging his own wells and he's consolidating and bringing into the world his own essence and his own desires. And he sees in this son Esau an uh, antithesis to himself and something that, that he couldn't do, a talent that he didn't have, that Esau had. And that if it was channeled in the right way, he could have 
brought about a, a perfect synthesis between Esau and Jacob, the man of the world and the field and the out and the physicality and the man of spirituality. And he, he obviously he doesn't choose that. And he he's you know I'm all I'm all you know perfect and I it's everybody else's fault. And at the end of the story. Um, as I mentioned, he married two wives who were idol worshippers. And at the end of the story, he marries again. And he marries the daughter of Yishmael, which is also interesting. Um, not somebody that I think his parents would be so proud of. But but he, he does marry and he marries again looking for, he's looking for, like he, he is a very complicated character, I would suggest, in that he, he on, on some level there are the... There are indications that he's trying to um, he's trying to be loved by his father. He's trying to live up to what his father wants, but he just can't. He can't. The forces that are pulling him away are too great. And then he has to sort of hide who he is from his father. And his father believes in him. His father is pure. His father doesn't recognize that he has these other uh, these uh, aspects. He's he's come from the home of Abraham, where he sees good in everybody and everything, and he's looking for the good in everybody and everything. Rebecca, on the other hand, came from a home of Lavan and came of a home where there was there wasn't there wasn't such goodness manifest all the time, and she was able to see the perhaps um, in Esau things that Jacob couldn't see. Excuse me, that Isaac couldn't see that she could see, and it was much harder for her to love that child than it was to love. Jacob. So that's that's interesting. And so um, let's see if I if there's anything particular to end on. But I think that one of the things that we learn about these two cosmic forces that Jacob is running um, in that story I told you about when the babies were in utero, when they were twins in utero and Rebecca, the mother, would walk by a, a holy place. Then the it says that the, the, the Jacob inside was like running, running to get out, running, wanting to get out. The word is ruts, wanting to get out and, and, and pursue that. There was a, an intense desire to pursue that avenue. And when she would walk by um, somewhere where there was idolatry going on, then the other child would be sort of like jostling and agitating inside. Does not use the word ruts, though. And um, Esawin pulls out the difference between the two energies and and what their um what the, how they manifest itself and and the the Jacob the Jacob force is the Jewish force is our force is the force that runs it's above time that is looking to always 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 you know gravitate ourselves and 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 and, and get close to spirituality and 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 raise up the physicality and bring that bring that spirituality out and that we're running 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 that we're looking all the time to find that spiritual that spirituality and that's what jacob represented and that's what we represent and that's what we should be doing <laughs> all the time is looking looking always to find the goodness and to like Isaac to be digging to dig inside ourselves to dig um, inside other people to dig inside the physical world to elevate it to use the physical um, tools that we are bestowed that we are gifted for good ways to increase spirituality and, and purity and holiness into the world and to do that and to love our children unconditionally I, I resonate much with Isaac the uh, unconditional loving father, um, the father who refuses to um, give up on his children, that wants to always find the good in their child, and and will not will not not rest until um, till the end. Like always looking to create relationship and to bestow love and to just kind of like um, be that unconditionally loving parent. And I and I as I get older and my children are all grown up, I find that that is more and more and more of the uh, it's not a challenge it's it uh, perhaps it almost gets easier because you're 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 a little bit more divorced from it like I, I i put my values into the world here they are you know what they are and now you live your life and i love you and i support you and i might not support everything you do but i love and support you and 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 and, and uh i'm here for you and to always be there i'm here for you always and you can always come back home and you can always find love and connection here in this home with these parents and to be that parent um, is uh, is a goal and it's not easy uh, but I think it is a goal and I think we learn that from Isaac I think Isaac shows us that even in the most difficult child in the most uh, challenging child that he continues to love and bestow blessing etc onto this child onto this child Esau one of the things about a blessing and why it is that he had to eat first 
And we do that when we um, say the blessings after we eat, is that it says that we have to eat and be satisfied, and then we thank God, then we bless God, then we, then we bless. There, there's something that we, when we come from a place of satiation, we're elevated, we're like, we're like happy, and we can, and we can, and we can bestow blessing, and we can thank God in a different way than when we're lacking. And so, um, so I guess that the blessing I have for all of us is that we are able to dig deep into ourselves, into other people, that we, uh, that we are always satiated, that we have everything we feel that we need to, uh, to be expansive and to overflow and to, um, and to, um, and to use our physicality to, um, manifest and, 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 and outpour spirituality and to, uh, to, uh, find the spirituality in the world and that we, um, unconditionally love the people in our lives. <laughs> it's a hard one. And, um, and now we're coming into Thanksgiving to, to like, you know, maybe with people that we're not used to being with and maybe they're going to rub us the wrong way, but like, just take a moment, talk to God. You know, we've always got God with us. Let's, let's, let's bring that whole, that whole, um, paradigm of how to live our lives, knowing that God's around with us always, and we can talk to him always. And sometimes that's the best place to go and to, and to, and to open up our hearts and to open up our, our emotional life there and then to unload there sometimes might be the best place to go. And, uh, and to, and that we should, um, and that should, we should be wholesome like, like Jacob and, um, and that we should be able to use all our, all of our, uh, strengths for good. So wishing you a happy week and a good Thanksgiving.